yourself considering to eat the same slop that the pigs are eating because now he has no money left. He has spent it all. He has done all the partying he wants to do. Friends are now nowhere to be found because all the money is gone and he finds himself in a pit with pigs. Now whether you think that is an actual story or whether you think that it's a metaphor because we all have been in that pit. We've all been to the place where we had no money left, where we had no friends left. They'd all turned away from you because all the partying is over. All the fun is over. All the uh, frivolous behavior and activity, all that's over. All that's gone. And now you're in a pit. And you're hungry. The bills haven't been paid. You've lost your home. You've lost your car. Now you've lost all your friends. And the son comes to his senses and says, you know what? I, I, I think I'm going to go to my father's house because even his servants have food enough to eat. Even his servants have a, a roof over their head. And he thinks to himself, I think you know, I think I'm going to go back to my father's house. And after all those years of being gone and spending up all the money and rebelling, essentially, against his father, his father is standing outside one day and he sees off in the distance, he sees this person coming down the road. And he's looking and he's, you know, I think that, by golly, I, th I think that's my, I think that's my son, my, my son who left me, my son who took all of the inheritance that I had from him. I, I think that's him. And before he even really discerns precisely that that's his son, he calls out to his servants and he says, get a party ready, get all the fixings ready, you know, uh, Barbecue that, that pig or that lamb and get all the dressing and all the good wine and the good clothes. And oh, by the way, bring those good robes and the rings because my son is coming home. My son is coming back to me. And then his son does come closer and he comes to his father and he basically you know, apologizes and begs his forgiveness. And the, and the father simply says, come on, come on, my son, you're home. And oh, if all of us could show that love, that type of concern, depth of affection and compassion to not just those who are our relatives, but Jesus, Jesus extended the command. He said, it is not good enough to love your friends, your family. Go a step further and love your enemies, the person that has done you the most harm, the person that you might think would rather uh, stab you in the back than to help you. Love that person. Because that is precisely the type and depth of love that not only our Lord and Savior displayed 
and embodied, but also our Heavenly Father, the Almighty God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the God who has no other God beside him, the Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God who has every right and certainly the capacity to take us out at any moment loves us, has a deep and profound concern and affection and compassion towards us. So it's at this point that we can see that mercy cannot fully be expressed without also love. And love seemingly could not fully be expressed without mercy. But even more so, justice could not be rightfully, earnestly carried out without either love or mercy. Because, you know, children, when your parents discipline you, when they put you on time out, when they may swatch your little behind, it is because they know that it's better to correct you now than to let you go on, continue in being wrong or inappropriate or even a danger to yourself. It is, it is more of a display of concern, compassion, and affection, true affection for you to discipline you now than it would be to let you just run off and do whatever your mind is thinking to do. So justice correction, uh, discipline, judgment also embodies that deep affection, compassion, and concern, love, and mercy. And God is the only being that can truly express justice without bias. You know, we know in our society, and of course much that is being debated and discussed today in this very climate that we are existing in, we know that the justice that man carries out is certainly not without bias. In fact, many of us say straight away, justice for some is not the same as justice for others. And more often than not, we're speaking of the discipline that is meted out, uh, how it is different in some cultures and some uh, uh, among some groups of people and not the same as others. But with God, remember, he is higher than we are. His ways are higher than our ways. He is a supreme being, not just a being, but a supernatural being. 
It is after all from him that we even get the idea of what justice is. There's a scripture that speaks of the fact that if there were no law, you would not know of sin. So in other words, if God had not provided the guidelines, then you would not have realized that you were doing something wrong. And therefore you could have gone on doing things inappropriately without the knowledge of those guidelines, without the knowledge of those boundaries. In other words, you would not know um, the features of the criteria regarding how you should conduct yourself. That is why in the Ten Commandments, God speaks not only about how you are to relate to him, but also how you will relate to other people. So he's given us some guidelines and it is from God that we have the fullest picture of what judgment is, of what justice is. He says in his words, in fact, I don't even want you to carry out any actions of vengeance Because I, the Lord, your God, have the best idea of how to carry out that judgment. So let me do it. In fact, let me do it because it's very possible that if you do it, you may have so much wrath and anger that you sin. That is why he tells us, be angry, but sin not. So it is from God that we get the very sense of what justice is. Justice probably ought to be thought of as a way to maintain our relationship with God rather than see justice or judgment as a strictly punitive idea. Justice, the very outlines and guidelines, the very boundaries that have been established are there so that we are able to maintain our relationship with God. And if you want to put it in more earthly terms, even with our parents or our relatives, and certainly, most probably importantly, within ourselves. You know, because most of the time that we become frustrated and disappointed with ourselves is because we have gone against a promise that we made to ourselves. You know, we, we promised that we were, you know, we were going to stop drinking all those sodas. You know, and a week goes by, two weeks go by, we're all great, three weeks go by, and a month later, we're drinking that soda again. You know, we're sitting there wondering, trying to figure out why are we frustrated, and really if we thought about it, it's because we broke the promise, the boundary that we had set for ourselves, we couldn't maintain it. So we're really upset with ourselves. You know how many people make those uh, New Year's resolutions? Midnight, December 31st, first thing in the morning, January 1st, you know, they're making those resolutions, they're making those promises to themselves. And sometimes before January is over, they've already gone against that self-created boundary. They've already fallen out of relationship with themselves. And in future, 